Okay. Am I live? <laughs> You're live. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much to Kevin and Martin for um, a great session. Uh, you're a, br a brilliant warm-up act, um, <laughs> but, but uh, more than that, you're a, a, a great support in the industry. And um, certainly at Green Gauge, we really appreciate that. And you really get sustainability and the fact that it's something we need to do to help the planet, but also it's a business opportunity at the same time. So uh, today, really pleased to join the webinar. Um, I'm doing a few of these at the moment. I did yesterday, I thought I'd, I'd share with you, I did a webinar yesterday. Uh, and my audience was primary school head teachers. So about five minutes, I'm just getting into my stride of my presentation. Uh, and a lady's face popped up onto the screen. She just joined a bit flustered. And she said, um, I'm really sorry I'm late, but I, I've been dressed as a banana and I had trouble getting out of the costume. So I just wanted to say this morning, if you are dressed as an item of fruit, um, please don't be embarrassed, it's absolutely fine. So my topic this morning um, is uh, the Green Revolution. I'm going to talk a bit about um, how far along the path we are to combating climate change, uh, what it means for business. So I suppose it's literally a bit of a, a temperature check. I don't know if anybody remembers the um, Flash Gordon movie. Um, and there's a, there's a great line in it. Flash, I love you, but we only have 14 hours to save the Earth. Hopefully, it's quite a good impression, I think. Um, well, this morning, I only have 14 minutes to talk about saving the Earth. And it's difficult to do justice to a big topic, but um, I'm going to give it a go anyway. And um, when I talk on this topic, inevitably, I talk about a lot of quite worrying trends. So... Uh, I can seem a bit doom laden. So I thought I would today turn it on its head and at least start by sharing a bit of progress and hope for the future. Um, and talking of hope, this is where I hope I can share my screen. <laughs> so it's the most difficult bit of any presentation. The thing is, I think, you know, the world has become very dependent on fossil fuels for, for generating energy. And, and that's anything from fueling a car or a power station and there's a huge problem of course because we want to reduce carbon emissions so the big coal-fired power stations so for a long time they've been amongst the worst sources of pollution in, in the world with huge amounts of co2 sulfur dioxide being going up into the atmosphere um, and they're cold they've been coal fired and we all probably remember do you remember the miners strike and you know when there was a strike mm. uh, we had power cuts <laughs> because the coal ran out but actually in the last few years we've had a bit of a silent revolution um and now kevin yes. what can you yes. see now <laughs> i can see a cow with wind turbines <laughs> growing Thank out of the tier. this is this is going to plan now thank you <laughs> so um Actually, what's happened now is coal has virtually no uh, part in um, power generation. We've probably seen those chim chimneys, you know, being blown up um, all over the place, all around the country. <clears throat> and actually, wind energy now represents about 25% of the total in the UK, which is amazing. I just think today, looking out the window, it's probably a bit more than that. <clears throat> but the plan is to go a lot further with carbon-free power generation. So by 2030, we've got much cheaper, um, cleaner energy. So here's a fascinating fact. <clears throat> Did you know that enough solar energy reaches the Earth in one hour to cover the entire planet's energy needs for one year? Wow. And yet solar energy meets only one tenth of a percent of global energy demand. Um, so, you know, this is a huge potential, really. Renewable power is um, immense in its potential. And I think we're going to see a big increase in the development of solar. Um, and there's, there's some amazing projects around the world to, to make this happen. And the fact is, we've got a huge demand um, for electric energy, especially if we want to power electric cars, for example. So if we can tap into unlimited sources of energy, and it's really exciting and I think where there's human ingenuity there's hope 
Um, we've mended the hole in the ozone layer. We landed on the moon. We created a COVID vaccine. But, you know, the clock is ticking. And for years, unfortunately, we've neglected to really tackle the climate emergency. So the effects of climate change, which are caused by greenhouse gases, are, um, I think it's not overstating to say we, it's taking us to the edge of disaster. And we're then adding to that by um, destroying our precious ecosystems as well. So right now we've got a bit of a narrow window of opportunity. Um, and beyond that, we probably can't reverse the effects of climate change, which would be horrendous. So um, that would be really serious and ultimately a lot more serious probably than the current coronavirus pandemic. So, you know, we've all seen, haven't we, on the TV, the, the effects of climate change around the world. And temperatures are now at their highest rate um, since, well, over 800,000 years. And there's a real close correlation between the rise in greenhouse gas emissions that are causing it. If you ever want to know what a tonne of CO2 looks like, well, here's a bit of a representation. And each year, we're pumping 50 billion tonnes of it into the atmosphere. And if you're looking for evidence of rising temperature, here's a couple of examples. Um, last year, 16th of August, we saw the world's highest ever temperature. It's 54.4 degrees Celsius in Death Valley, California. Same time of year, Siberia set a record for the highest temperature ever recorded in the Arctic Circle at 38 degrees. Now, six years ago, the, the Paris Climate Accord resulted in a pledge by 196 countries towards holding down global temperature rises to well below two degrees, and ideally not more than 1.5 degrees. Uh, the moment we're way off track, um, haven't really done a lot since then. Um, and on current trends, we, we certainly are likely to breach the 1.5 degrees. Um, and then probably go on to get to about three or four degrees warming. But it's kind of a difficult thing to kind of get in your head, isn't it? Well, three or four degrees doesn't really sound that much. So I thought this was quite an interesting map to, to demonstrate what it would look like if we were plus four degrees. Uh, and just the thing to focus on is green is where you can live um, and yellow is where you probably won't be able to live. So. If you fancy an apartment in Western Antarctica, well, that could be on its way. Now, this is this is my Professor Chris Whitty <laughs> slide. It is horrendous, isn't it? But and don't worry about this. Please just look on the left hand side and you can see that wiggly line going up, um, which shows CO2 emissions from 1980 rising. And then this massive drop from kind of about now when we have to do everything to then get CO2 emissions down to a level where we can get to carbon zero. And, and so it's a, it's a horrendous slide, but it just shows why we need to take action now. And we need to reduce by about 45% um, CO2 by the end of this decade. So it's a big, it's a big challenge really. Um, and of course, apart from greenhouse gases, there are all kinds of other things we're doing to muck up our planet. Um, so, for example, in, in the time taken for this webinar, um, a size of an area of forest around about four and a half thousand soccer pitches down, um, and a large percentage of that deforestation is in South America, um, where the Amazon, unfortunately, has already shrunk by 17%. It's a big problem because, of course, we need trees to capture air from uh, carbon from the air. Um, and as we were talking about right, right at the beginning, when we were having a chat, you know, plastic is a real um, plague as well, uh, whether it be uh, thrown away masks um, or bottles, you know, that's, that's a, a real issue too. So, um, 2021 has to be the turning point uh, in tackling the climate crisis. Um, and there is potential for it to be that, I'm hoping that um, by the time we get to the COP26 climate change conference, 
vaccines will have kicked in and we'll be talking more about climate than coronavirus. So this um, conference this, this year is probably our last chance to get a global consensus and commitment on firm actions that can reverse where we are at the moment. So I'd say nobody can delay action for another year whether it's business or just things we are doing personally, we all make, need to make some quite big changes. So some company names here. Um, companies are getting it and deciding they must do something. And in recent months, we've seen a, a lot of commitments from organisations like you can see here. And AstraZeneca, for example, they've pledged to be carbon zero by 2025 and carbon negative by 2030. NHS um, carbon neutral by 2040. So I think this year we're going to see a lot of organisations focusing on their supply chain, making sure they're working with companies that have green credentials. Um, and you're going to see requests to quote and tenders, whatever business sector you are in, that they're increasingly going to have green um, hoops to jump through. Um, I have to say, by the way, universities are fantastic at this <laughs> it's a very it's a very well developed um, in terms of their approach to sustainability um, actually i think companies are and other organizations um, are realizing that acting sustainably can make them more successful um, as well as contributing to a, a better planet uh, i'm talking of universities because uh, i know we've um, we've got alexis up on today you know there's a lot of pressure, peer pressure, isn't there, from your customers, students, that they, they have, they're demanding this now. So um, carbon efficient organisations do outperform others and create better shareholder returns. CDP is the global disclosure system for organisations um, to manage environmental impact. Uh, and they found that companies who cut emissions increased revenue whilst at the same time reducing costs. There's a real, so there's a real kind of commercial benefit there. So all of this stuff I'm, I've been talking about, you know, is why I set up Green Gage and I've been in um, the traveler meeting sector for uh, many years. And I realized that as a sector, we're actually contributing to the problem, um, whether that's CO2 emissions from flights or food waste from hotel restaurants. And yet, uh, as an industry and other public and private sectors also have the levers to make a real positive uh, difference and lead the way to others. So um, at Green Gage, what we do is we work with a, a diverse set of companies, all of who want practical advice on how to be greener. Uh, and it's a lot would be saying, uh, where do I start? Um, and others, they just kind of want a, a helping hand on the on the journey. And that's that's what we are. Um, here for. I think the important thing for us all to recognise is that being sustainable can be a really positive thing and it's okay to make money and do good at the same time. So our aim um, at Green Gage is really to assist clients in helping preserve the planet but at the same time using sustainability as a competitive edge um, and also as a way of um, saving costs as well. So I'd say for any business wanting to be sustainable, um, this is our checklist of what you should be aiming for. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, of course, can help with these, these things. Um, and I, just focusing on one or two of these. So in terms of regulation, we will see a lot more regulation coming into the market. <clears throat> Many companies already have to report their greenhouse gas emissions, and I, I predict the net is going to widen with smaller and smaller companies being required to, to report it um, as well. Talking about client expectations, I would say that even if your business isn't that interested in sustainability, the chances are your customers or clients will be, um, whether it's business to business, business to consumer, um, I'm old enough to remember persuading my parents to buy a particular cereal because there was a little plastic toy in there. So that was my influence. Now it's probably slightly different. We've now got children um, highly informed who are influencing the choice of car and saying we you ought to have electric. Um, in terms of reputation, 
you know, some organizations are really boosting their brands by embracing sustainability and as a core value. And I'm thinking here, uh, IKEA, Innocent Drink, Neil's Yards, they do it really well. Um, and interestingly, in, in, because we do um, a lot of accreditation work with hotels and, and, um, and venues, we've continually asked for purchasing recommendations um, on anything from uh, renewable electricity, for example, to um, beer. So, so what we've been doing is we've, we've been creating a directory of products from ethical companies who offer sustainable products um, and services. So we've we found some brilliant organizations like um, Good Energy, uh, who do sustainable um, gas and electricity, Cheeky Panda, um, amazing company who um, use bamboo to make um, paper products. Uh, and my favorite, Toast Beer, who create beer out of um, using uh, bread crusts. Fabulous. And well, in each of these cases, a greener approach is giving them a competitive edge. And I think at the same time, being green and reducing your carbon footprint often um, gives you some cost savings as well, particularly lots of things to do with um, energy. If you promote a culture that engages and retains staff, um, a lot of research shows that you will um, keep hold of your staff and actually actively attract new ones and, and that job seekers are targeting companies that they perceive as acting sustainably. Um, and when we talk to companies and suggest, you know, like a green action committee, there's never any um, shortage of people volunteering for that. And also, I think um, having a sustainable approach, it, it doesn't have a beginning and an end. It's really an ongoing process. So it's a great way of, of demonstrating a continuous improvement. Um, and of course, in, everything you do in this area is very good to support any um, CSR strategy. Now, here's another checklist, and I'm not going through it, so don't worry about that. Um, but I'm happy to circulate this. It's, it's, I think it's just good to have a planned approach um, and also think right at the start, what is it you want to achieve? Like, um, it could be like AstraZeneca, you want a firm carbon commitment um, or something much simpler than that. And if I focus just for a moment on accommodation and meetings, because we do a lot in this area, um, I think hotels and venues, they're going to be expected to demonstrate clear, sustainable credentials. And there's an increasing evidence that travellers see this as a really significant factor in, in choosing a hotel. So um, it's the same for meeting organisers as well, who spend much more time now on due diligence and, and pick places that um, can demonstrate eco-credentials. So right now, hotels who do sustainability well are at a real um, competitive advantage. <clears throat> so what we did last year is we created EcoSmart um, accreditation, really to, to recognise um, and help hotels and venues that are doing their bit for the planet. Um, we, we positioned it for the uh, business traveller meetings market. <clears throat> and, and the thing is, you know, official accreditation really can add credibility to any sustainability initiatives and, and helps identify any gaps as well so you can make improvements. Um, we do this with a, it's a simple audit of um, operational aspects. You can see what they are on, on the, the left hand side. And um, so um, venues that have gone through this, they get um, certification from bronze to platinum. A lot of the Trident venues, most of them actually are, have been accredited. But we didn't want it to be just kind of like a little badge that gets slapped on. We wanted it to be uh, more of an ecosystem dedicated to supporting hotels through the sustainability journey and, and finding ways to actively turn um, that advantage into business. So we've got a, a nationwide network now and it incorporates everything really from hotels, venues, universities, um, or even, you know, a patch of ground, which is fantastic for holding an outdoor event, you know, we could we can include that as well. So um, we think we'll probably be at several hundred properties by the end of the year. And if, if you want to have a look, just just have a look on our website. We've got our online directory there. 
Okay, so I'm going to conclude now and really just say that um, at Green Gauge, our mission isn't really about changing the world. We don't think that's going to happen from our efforts, but we do want to try and help deliver lots of small changes that could add up to making a real difference. So um, I hope you found this session useful. Um, and of course, if you've got any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. If you'd like a copy of um, anything you've seen this morning, do let, do let me know and you can visit our website for, for more information. So I think that's, um, that's my last slide. Hopefully you, you did see those. <laughs> um, and if there's anything you want, to, any comments or questions, of course, I'm very happy to, to uh, talk about that. I realise we've only got five minutes, but um, back back over to to um, everybody else. Um, I, I've got a comment to make, and as you know, Andrew, I'm and Martin. As I keep ramming it down Martin's throat, uh, I'm I'm very much for and wanting to support sustainability in, in our venues, and and I think as an industry as a whole, um, hospitality and the meetings and events industry. One of my biggest frustrations is when you go walking down the park and there's like rubbish that's being chucked here, there and everywhere, which, and I think if the hospitality meetings and events industry can be seen to be taking the fore as far as sustainability is concerned, then hopefully by osmosis that will work through to the little scrotes who chuck their rubbish on the floor. Did I just say that? <laughs> but, but, yeah. But but I, I think we really can. Um, we, I, I really think that as an industry, we can we can help create a bit of a sea change um, with Joe Soap on the on the on the street. You know, someone who perhaps has got a little one who's interested but really couldn't be asked himself. Uh, I think by going to visit our venues, going to visit our hotels, staying in our hotels, if the message is there and the message is clear then hopefully that will work back to, to the customers that then will work back into the local community. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think it's a really good point, Kevin. And, uh, you know, I guess a lot of the people who are on the street are also visiting hotels, going to, to mm. conferences mm. Uh, and so on. Uh, and what we're finding is that <clears throat> a lot of, when it comes to events now, um, there's, much more likely to be a green flavour mm. to them. Um, companies just want want that now because because it's kind of for them a, a window on a shop window, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, and there's an expectation both internal and external mm. to um, uh, for it to reflect the brand in a nice in a good way. Mm. And yesterday, you know, I mentioned I was uh, on this webinar with um, head teachers, um, and this is because. You know this type of message I'm talking about today. It's this is it's so important as part of education, isn't it, to make mm. sure this this yeah. comes across. And and um, we did a webinar last week, and one of the one of the people uh, on there they watched a recording of it, um, and their seven year old daughter was also um, watched it with them, um, and they after that um, said, "Mum, this is." We've got to do something about the climate. Went off with a paper and pen and drew, drew this amazing poster. And I just love the fact that, you know, a presentation like this, which is fairly, fairly technical, it was similar to this, but the seven year old got that, thought we've got to do something about this. So it doesn't matter what age people are, whether it's a seven year old or a David Attenborough, everybody's kind of um, in this and has a part to play. So we, we're trying to do a bit on the education side because you're quite right we just need to get the message out and as an industry we kind of you know have some bit of thought leadership yeah i noticed that dan's made quite a, a, a good comment dan do you want do you want to um voice it dan <laughs> yeah so i was just thinking with the chancellor's announcement on capex um is this the time for venues to invest in tech for hybrid events so that we can lower the carbon footprint of events. Yeah, I think that sounds... Uh, okay. Did you hear that, Andrew? I didn't. I've, I've suddenly got a message saying <coughs> unstable internet network. So right. apologies <laughs> for that. I didn't, I didn't hear the, the question, sorry, or the comment. Uh, 
Dan was saying that, I'll just find his comments, so I'll read it. With the Chancellor's announcement on CapEx, is this the perfect time for venues to invest in tech for hybrid events uh, to as part of the lowering of their carbon footprint um, of, of events taking place in that particular venue? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a, it is such a good point, that. And I think whilst we all want to get back to some of the normality of actually meeting people, um, I think <clears throat> hybrid events is going to be really critical to, to the success of um, uh, uh, meetings and events in the, in the next year or so. Um, and of course, you know, I think there's going to be a lot fewer people holding events abroad. You know, it's just not going to be, be quite the right thing <laughs> anymore. So hybrid events is the, the brilliant way of actually still making um, uh, a conference or an event global, but with uh, an amazingly lower um, carbon footprint. So uh, I think I think Dan's absolutely right that now is the time to, to be investing in that mm. uh, technology because this is this is going to remain as the future. Super. It's eleven o'clock, and we appreciate that uh, time's not on not on our side, uh, but Claire. Thank you. Do you want to do the wrap up? Yes, I do. Thank you. Thanks, so Andrew. Much. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we will send a, um, a link out just to put a link through to our YouTube channel so that you can catch up on any of this. If anybody's got any uh, other burning questions, we can put you in touch with any of the speakers. Um, and we will be back in two weeks' time with um, Sarah Thompson from Octopus, um, and she specialises in revenue management. Um, and Rachel Halling from Halling Consultancy, who is a very experienced spa manager and was the principal at Shantley's College. Um, so that should be interesting so that we try and encompass all parts of hospitality businesses. Um, so thank you ever so much for coming, everybody, and we hope to see you in two weeks' time. Thank you. Keep safe, everyone. Yep. Thanks very much. And keep your Thanks carbon down. <laughs>